had guys, you have guys with, with just ridiculous stuff and ridiculous command, which do you think is number one, the most important of those two, two, the easiest to teach? Is it easier for you to teach stuff or, and how can you teach command? Command's the more, most important thing that you have. Location is most important. And how you do you teach that? By having side sessions down in the bullpen. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and working on command, especially the alignment up with our fastball, uh, which was, which, uh, uh, uh Matt, it was huge to Maddox and then it became huge to all of us. Uh, but, and here's the thing too, they, the, if you have a reliever, we had a program where, you know, I looked around the big leagues and, uh, and you can, t you, you're hearing Johnny Sane and me speak the same language because we, you know, we were kind of rebels and I would look around the big leagues and I thought, when, when does a reliever ever work with a pitching coach once the season starts? Well, they don't, you know? So I told the relievers, I said, if somebody doesn't get in the game for two days or warm up, don't get in the game or warm up and for two, two days, don't do nothing. I want you to come down to the bullpen and have a little session with me before the game. And so anyway, I had an executive come down and say, tell me the next day, he goes, hey, I saw you uh, uh, working down in the bullpen with Steve Vedrosian. I said, yeah. He goes, well, he's a reliever. He said, and what, what if he... What if he had to pitch that night? I said, that's what we were preparing for, that he would pitch that night. And when he did get in, he'd have, be a little sharper and have a little feel for his pitches. You know, I mean, he is. It's, it's, it's not that difficult. And does, does all that transfer? So at, at Furman, I assume we're, we're throwing regularly? So for us, that yes, we our guys throw off the mound a good bit. And for, for us, you know, that is – if I were to list, put together a list of top five things that Leo has brought to me, that's that's up there. If if not in the top three, I mean, it is in definitely in the top five. Because at, at the college level, sometimes you get so handcuffed with what you should do with your relievers. Because you've got the mandatory off day, then you got the travel day sometimes on Thursday, so you're not able to do – and then you got class. So, you know, it, you kind of get handcuffed sometimes with your relievers – and those guys are the guys you're getting most frustrated with sometimes because middle of the season, you're counting on these guys to get some of the biggest outs, and they're not sharp. And the reason they're not sharp is because, well, a guy threw three innings early for you on Tuesday night, so he didn't throw on, on Wednesday. Maybe he didn't throw on Thursday, and then he's your best reliever. So you got Friday night, the, the, you know, the opening night of a big conference series, so you don't want to throw a bullpen with him there because if it's a one- or two-run game, he's probably going to come in and relieve. And uh, you score eight in the fourth and you're up. So, well, we're not going to use them tonight. So, you know, then you get in a situation of maybe it's been four or five days before this guy's thrown last. Um, for us, it's, it's hard in stone rule. You never go more than two days without touching the rubber um, as a reliever. So if you throw on Tuesday night, three innings in relief, you're off Wednesday. If you want to throw on Thursday, I give my guys that option. If you want to throw on Thursday, because typically you don't ever play on Thursday. Um, if you want to throw on Thursday and not throw pregame, that's fine. If you would rather wait and get that extra day, we'll throw pregame, you know, during home BP. And those are my best bullpens because guys, it's so much easier to regulate their effort pregame because they know that, all right, well, I'm, there's a chance I'm getting into the game tonight, so I don't want to blow it out. But as Leo says, I always approach my guys, hey, listen, throw in the pen right now what you think you need to do to be best prepared for the game tonight. And once I say that, I don't have to say another word during their entire pen because in their heads they already know, well, hey, listen, Coach already told me there's a good chance I'm coming to the game tonight. So they back off a little bit. And, you know, Leo mentioned it too. We don't – you know, it's never a pitch count for us. I mean, a guy might get on a, on a bullpen and throw 13 pitches. I, you know, I don't know. Sometimes they might throw 22. I, I have no clue. It's once they feel good about their stuff, both all pitches, both sides of the plate, and they get out of there. I mean, sometimes it's three minutes. So for us, that is that's one of the most important things that that and the way we set up our starters and the sense of what they do between starts is probably some of the most important stuff he's he's taught me. Leo, you things are going well right in the '90s. You have the best pitching staff. Uh, you're the greatest. But how for you did you you know each year evaluate yourself and and figure out where you want to improve and how you were going to do that? I just went into every year approaching everything in a very consistent manner. I'd say that cons being consistent is one of the most important things a coach can be. So every year, I, I didn't try to reevaluate anything. 
you know, I was happy with how everything turned out, uh, win, lose, or draw, because I know that we put all our thought process into it, our hard work. So to me, you couldn't tell that when we came to spring training or had our early throwing programs, whether we won the World Series or lost it the year before. We were preparing for this year. And, you know, we had a, we had a saying, your most important pitch is always your next pitch, you know, and, uh, and your most important outing is always your next outing. Well, my most important year coming up was the same as it was last year, but it's now it's a, now it's a new year. There may be a couple different uh, pitchers that have a chance to make your staff, uh, but be very consistent in your approach. Be very consistent with your throwing programs, uh, your 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 running programs, uh, how you want things done. It didn't ever change for 15 years. What about the guys themselves? If you know you you have pitchers and they develop and then they change or maybe they get older and the velocity is not there. The movement's not there on certain pitches. Like how often did you find yourself at the beginning of the year needing to make adjustments with some of these guys and tweak the way that who they were going to be that season? Well, I, I, I think number one, uh, once again, if they were down on velocity, I didn't really care. You know, I didn't care. And the, the adjustments being made were, were the adjustments being made were uh, working on command control. And here's what you got to remember. A lot of guys, when their velocity went down, quit trusting their fastball and start trying to trick a hitter. Well, as soon as you do that, you're going to be in trouble. So we emphasized 80% of our practice time on fastball command, regardless of velocity. That answers the question earlier when they said stuff or command. It's command, location. And uh, I remember um, Bruce Suter and Ted Simmons getting me together one time when I was a young pitching coach. They said, would you rather have uh, uh, what's more important, stuff or location? I said, stuff. They said, no, you're wrong. It's location. And then I started learning, you know, as I went. This is when I was very young in the minor leagues as a pitching coach. And they sure as hell were right. It is location. And, uh, you know, that you, you're talking about Hall of Famers giving you this information or Hank Aaron giving you that information or Eddie Matthews. You know what he said to me? He goes, Leo, he said, you tell you make sure you tell your hit, tell your pitchers that we can time a jet coming through that strike zone if we see it often enough. OK, it's back to saying change in speeds. See, it makes a full circle. So every approach was the same every year, being very consistent with what you do. And if you have to make an adjustment, you know, you, you make it think you make the pitcher think it's very minor. Is, is there any technology that you like today? So say there's, you know, I, I get a, a whole sense of of old school stuff. Is there anything that spin rate? Uh, Anything that you use today that you think, hey, this would be awesome if I had this back in the day or now? You know what this, you know what I think? I think everything they're doing now, we did. Only they word it differently. They make it more analytical. They make it sound more uh, like a, a, you know, whatever it is. We, we did the same things. They just, they, we did the same things. They are saying, we said it in, we put it in layman's terms. They put it in analytical terms. It's the same stuff. Going back through old videos. And if you see the same spinner, that literally is, is the concept of, of spin access. So it is right. like everything old is, is, is new again. I, I, do you feel sometimes it's done to some of the analytical terms are done to create a barrier to make it say like, Hey, we're doing something different now. Um, and you guys can't keep up. What you were doing back then is 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 no good. Yeah, that's their own ignorance if they think that. Leo, I got some questions for you that came in from other college pitching coaches that filmed them. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pop them on here, let you watch them, and answer a couple of those if that sounds good to you. Sure. Leo, Josh Jordan, associate coach and recruiting coordinator at Duke University. My question for you is this. If you were a pitching coach today at any level, how would you manage the misconception of velocity increase and velocity gain to the overall development of a pitcher? I basically, basically what you do is there's one way. Arm strength is, is built on throwing more often with less exertion, okay? If you want to go long toss to build, it can't be uh, uh, from one foul line to the other foul line where you have to exert every gut in your body. You can't pick up – there's no quick trick to get picking up velocity, okay? You, a pitcher grows into his velocity, but you can't improve velocity unless you throw a baseball. But you, when you throw a baseball more often with less exertion and you can practice your craft and your arm feels good, you're going to pick up a mile or two or whatever. So, you know, it's, there's no quick fix to say, well, we're going to increase velocity here. 
No, you're gonna let you're gonna make them pitch. You want them to pitch, not increase velocity. If that whatever velocity, they, and they will increase it over a period of time. Went from the beginning of the season all the way through if they're healthy and making their making their starts. Hey coach, how we doing? This is Skyler Mead, assistant coach at the University of South Carolina. Uh, my question for you is this. What was the specifics of some of your higher profile guys, maybe the Glavins, the Maddoxes, the Averys? Um, what was their throwing routine and their, you know, specifically their mound or spot work routine over the course of a long year, I know you're all, you know, in between rest days or shorter than us at the collegiate level, but I'm curious just from a, you know, very direct nature, what those guys did and how much they altered maybe over the course of the season and maybe for some of them, their career. Thanks. And I'll look forward to hearing your answer. What they did in, in, uh, in the early throwing program and spring training was the same thing we were doing in August, September, and hopefully October. We never changed our routines at no time. No time did we ever change our routine. We were consistent with what we did every day. We didn't back down certain uh, um, amount of pitches in between. We didn't back down not throwing in between and skipping stuff. The worst thing you can do is get a pitcher out of a routine. You keep a pitcher in his routine from start to finish. As soon as you back somebody down or give them too much rest, then they have to crank it back up again. That's harder on your arm than staying in your own routine. So their routine was to start, take a day off, pitch in between a couple times, take a day off and pitch, you know. Matt, every once in a while, Maddox would tell me, look, I feel great with my pitches. I'm going to do one practice session over – but it could that it could have been April or it could have been October. That's up to him as an individual, you know. And Glavin, he'd like to throw a lot – he'd like to throw twice in between every once in a while. He'd like to throw the day before. But you were always encouraging the guys to get out on the mound and nothing changed from the beginning of the season – to the end of the season, consistent with what you do. Hey, Leo, Dan Drellinger here, pitching coach at Saracosa Community College in Ridgecrest, California. My question for you today is about pitchers' workload. You've long been a proponent of pitchers throwing more, not less, in between outings. My question is, how did you arrive at that philosophy, and has it changed at all in today's game? Thank you very much. Well, well I learned that philosophy from uh, 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 Johnny Sane who had the greatest success of any pitching coach in the history of the game. And so therefore, when I incorporated his philosophy into my throwing programs and then added my, my, my two cents to it, because it was based on a five man rotation. So that's where I learned that, you know, learn how to throw more often with less exertion because he had the most success of any pitching coach in the history of the game. <clears throat> and I came in right behind him over a course of time, but you encourage guys to get on the mound and throw. And the bottom line is, you, the coach, have to regulate the effort. You've got to regulate the effort. This program does not work if a coach can't regulate the effort. If you let them just go ahead and start gunning it on every pitch, gunning, 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 gunning. What we used to say is this. Get them on the mound. Maybe you're fir firm up your pitches at the end. That's a great term to use, firm. Be firm those pitches up because they would say to me, well, you're going to uh, run it up when the game starts. I said, you're going to have more adrenaline. But if you firm your pitches up and don't try to go super power and super control, you're going to have success. And so it all starts with what you're communicating with that pitcher in the bullpen sessions. And I, I hope I've answered your question. Hey, Leo. This is Chris Fetter, pitching coach at the University of Michigan. Thank you for taking the time to share your wisdom with us. Um, you know, got to coach three of the best to ever throw baseball in our game with Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, and Tom Glavin. Just a quick question. What separated those guys? Obviously, they have elite level arm talent, but what separated them in terms of their mental preparation, their mental game, and, you know, competitiveness on the mound? What separated them from the average? Thank you again for taking the time, and uh, go Blue. Uh, well, here, here's what separates the big three. Separated the big three. They, they all had the same approach of banging strikes and changing speeds. We're changing uh, movement, change of speeds. Uh, and, but Glavin was very stubborn, okay? He would not give in to the strike zone. He would not give in to the umpire strike zone. He would not give in to the hitter strike zone. For example, we walked a guy with the bases loaded uh, uh, unintentionally, but we didn't give in to him, and then he retired 18 in a row after that, knowing that if you ever hear a pitcher say, well, I can't walk the guy because the bases are loaded. Yes, you can. If you only give up one run, you can, you know. And so Glavin's mindset was very strong-minded. Don't give in, change speeds. And, um, and uh, he, you know, 
he said to me one time, he said, Hit, hitters have egos and I'm going to take advantage of them. That was his mental approach. John Smoltz, John Smoltz came out with a great breaking ball, great fastball. He had a very difficult time throwing a change. So he never trusted his change up. So I decided that whether we should go with a split as his third pitch, split finger, because the feel on it wouldn't, wouldn't have to be so difficult. But what I did before I taught Smoltzy that split finger was I went and visited Bruce Suter. I got in touch with Bruce Suter and tell him to give me all his information on the split, which I passed along to Smoltz, and Smoltzy developed it in a very quick time. And then Smoltzy was just a, he was a great athlete, but he's, he, you know, he, he, he attacked you. And uh, uh, with Maddox, uh, Glavin owned the down and away strike. Maddox owned the down and away strike. Smoltzy owned the down and away strike. Maddox, though, could, he pitched inside more, but if you watch them pitch, Maddox pitched inside more to lefties than he did. And righties, he was pretty much down and away a lot, and then he would go in with movement. But Maddox would go in more to lefties. He'd go strike one down and away, cutter above the hands, and then the two-seam comebacker to the left-handed hitter. Or if it, And if he didn't catch him there, he would go to a changeup. He also threw a lot of right change-ups to right-handed hitters as he moved on, adjusted in his career. Glavin, he had trouble with left-handed hitters early in his career until he started throwing his changeup to left-handers just like he would right-handers, which uh, we worked on continuously. All Smoltzy, right. Smoltzy, pure, Smoltzy was pure stuff, and but he ended up with great control. So And they're, they're, they were always in attack mode. Uh, so... You know, so they were they were similar, yet they did it in different ways. Hey, Leo, this is Micah Posey at ETSU. Um, the question I had was, you know, you had Maddox, Smoltz, Glavin, um, some guys with elite mentalities. You always heard the stories of Maddox not wanting to throw a ball above the mask in his bullpen sessions. Can you kind of go into what those guys' mentalities were like in between starts, uh, maybe when the lights weren't so bright, and, uh, you know, what went into making them great in, the, in their preparation? I appreciate it. Well, they they were the same, you know. Very, you know, they, they they didn't just go lollygag through their practice sessions. They were very intense. You know, Maddox would get upset if he was off by an inch, you know. And Glavin, he would he would he would get upset if it did something didn't feel right. Smoltzy was the same way. I, Glavin, he he could he could get it, get down to those side sessions. He would he went longer than anybody. Smoltzy, would, depending on how he felt, would go shorter, long. And Maddox had the same routine every single time. Uh, but it didn't sometimes. But the, the, it wasn't just going down there and getting your work in. It was going down there, exchanging ideas. A lot of times they were all down there together, including I had them come down when other pitchers threw, especially our younger pitchers, so that they could have some input and then they could exchange ideas. Because a lot of times Bobby would say, where's all the pitchers? I'd say, well, they're down in the bullpen with Leo. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, therefore, it wasn't just going through the – but they controlled their effort. This is the key, guys. They controlled their effort, you know, making your pitches. We were 80% was on fastball command down and away. We wanted to own the down and away strike so that we could pitch inside effectively and selectively. If we didn't own the down and away strike, then it moves a hell of a lot harder to pitch inside, you know. Well, you could, if you own the down and away strike, you can expand in quads. You can expand up and away, up and in, down and in, down and away. You can expand those pitches. But if you don't know the down and away strike, throw it all out the window. So the fastball command in all our practice sessions was key under control. Yeah. So, Leo, if you had to choose one pitch, and you had some just ridiculous pitchers, you have Smoltz's slider, Glavin's changeup, Maddox's comeback, two-seamer. What do you got? You got three Hall of Famers. <laughs> <laughs> That's really hard, isn't it? Well, I, you can't. That's, that's, I, can't I, I can't pick one of those because, you know, Maddox's comebacker was awesome. Smoltz's breaking ball was awesome. Glavin's fastball changeup was awesome. But it, it all comes off one thing, guys, fastball command. And all three of them were well above average with fastball command. And they, did, and they were well above average in making – this game was about they, – all they, they, all they cared about was making pitches. If you notice, the, they weren't crazy about the running game. Their game was to make pitches. I had one time where we're going to play Cincinnati before we played uh, Cleveland in the World Series, and we were underdogs to Cincinnati because of Cincinnati's superior running game. 
So the, the writers would come to me and say, Leo, they said, Cincinnati's got a superior running game. Are you, what are you doing to stop it? I said, well, we're down to bullpen working. He goes, well, are you working on any pickoff, different moves or timing or timing plays at second or third? Whatever? Da, 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 da. I said, no, we're down in the bullpen working on making pitches. They said, well, what about the running game? I said, if we make our pitches, there isn't any running game. I said, the last I heard you, last I heard you can't steal first. You know? And they guess what? There wasn't no running game. So, so you said you you're big on learning from from pitchers as well as I mean obviously you're communicating with them but the big thing is listening. What was the biggest thing you've learned from the big three, each one individually? What did you learn from Maddox? What did you take from Smoltz, and what did you take from from Glavin? Well, I I think one time one time Smoltz started a game in uh, his mind. Show you the mindset how smart these guys. Smoltz started a game in Cincinnati, right? This is during the regular season because we knew we were going to play him in the playoffs probably. He started out with 32 straight fastballs. Bobby Cox looked at me and goes, well, I guess this is going to be a fastball day, huh, Leo? So Smolsey, I come in, and Smolsey's getting him out. I come in, and he said, Smolsey, I said, what the hell are you doing? I said, well, 30, that's 32 straight fastballs. He goes, yeah, I'm setting them up for the playoffs. <laughs> and I went, okay. And then, wow. with, and, you know, and with Glavin, you know, one, one time uh, I went out to the mound, and Tommy uh, had trouble with Kevin Mitchell. Remember, Kevin Mitchell was a big power hitter. And it was the bases loaded and, and uh, two outs. So I went out to the mound, and I said, Tommy, I said, no, I want you to pitch to Mitchell just like, just like there was nobody on. I said, because you got a base open. And he looked at me. He goes, I don't, I don't know what the hell game you're looking at. He goes, but last I looked, the bases were loaded. I said, he said, would you mind telling me what's open? I said, yeah, home plate. And he looked at me, and he said, don't give in, right, Leo? I said, don't give in. He threw a 3-2 changeup lower than low, and Mitchell took it for ball four. The run scores, right? He retired 18 in a row and won the game five to two. Maddox, one time we had a – this is to give you good examples. One time we had a situation where he went to Bobby Cox and, and told him, he says, look, I can't uh, – Louis, Louis Gonzalez of Arizona owned him. He could not get Ma him out. And Bobby refused to have Maddox walk anybody because he just – there's nobody we thought he couldn't get out. We told Bobby if the, if the game was on the line to go ahead and walk Gonzalez, it was fine with him. That's how much respect. That's how much respect that uh, Bobby had for all our all our pitchers, and uh, so the game was on the line about the sixth inning, and 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 Bobby goes, well, Leo, he said, there's first base is open. He says, I guess this is the guy we got to put him on. He said, because he told me to go ahead and put him on if he wanted to. I said, he says, what do you think? I said, I think you should go out to the mound and ask him what he wants to do because he knows better than us what what he wants to do. And he goes, you know what? You're right. So he goes out to the mound. And Maddox is talking, because back in, Bobby looks down, sits down next to me, goes, wait, do you hear this? And I'm leaving some words out. And I said, why, what's going on, what's going on? He goes, well, he said, I went out there to tell him, you know, let's go to walk the guy. And he goes, no, 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 wait a minute. He says, give me two pitches. He said, if I get behind in the count, two balls and no strikes, I'll put him on. But I think I can pop him up to third. So Bobby goes, Leo, he, he, he thinks he can pop him up to third. He said, let's see how this turns out. Well, once he told me that, I knew it was going to be a cutter above the hands you know, off the plate with, and where he'd have to fight the pitch off. He popped the ball up to chipper in foul territory at third. So those are just, you know, you and Steve Avery. Steve Avery was the kind of kid that uh, uh, he was scouting. What he loved to do is warm up and find out what he had and then go from there. And if it wasn't like the scouting report said, he didn't care. You know, he had good stuff. He had good stuff, you know, and uh, – and it was all, always in attack mode. Uh, and, but, you know, most of the pitchers that we had over that great run had the mindset of, of going strike one. If we, if we went strike one, we were going to win. We could expand the zone. If we were going two to one strikes to balls with our fastball, we were going to dominate the game. As soon as it got to 60-40, there wasn't any three up, three down innings. So we had simple simplicity things like that. That, we, that, those, that was my analytics, okay? That was about the simple part of the game, making sure that we took care of strike one, making sure that we took care of the fastball down and away for a strike, you know, so that, so that everything else would work off that. And we practiced on that all the time. But guess what? We were able to practice with it all the time because we threw more often with less exertion, which got us on the mound more often. And it wasn't only those, it wasn't only those three. It was everybody for 15 years. Caleb, you um, have a lot of resources that Leo has, has given you to study. 
What, which of those resources has been most valuable to you and why? Well, besides uh, Leo's cell phone number, I would say uh, the notebook he gave me in the 94 season um, where, where Leo's got a notebook, it's like a college rule notebook with, you know, handwritten notes on every time a guy picked up the ball between from Camp Leo to the end of the season, which that year I believe uh, ended a whole lot sooner than uh, than – than normal, but, um, you know, being able to just go through that, I, I base a lot of our throwing program off of that. Um, you know, our guys were on the mound their first day of a wild, you know, um, participation for us in the fall. They're on the first day. And, you know, another thing is, you know, one of Leo's big sayings is we bring all, along all our pitches at the same time. Um, so our first bullpen, our guys are throwing fastballs, breaking balls, change-ups, everything they got. Yeah, um, There's a lot of different stuff that Leo has taught me that that is – you know, very, very valuable. You know, another thing that, you know, I think a lot of fall college coaches struggle with in the fall is, you know, inner squads trying to get your guys ready because then you got that big break in December. Of, you know, what the heck do you do with that? And um, being able to give my guys resources, you know, one thing Leo always told me was, listen, when you're bringing your guys along, as important as pitch count is, so is getting up and getting down. So if you tell a guy, hey, you got 25 pitches a day or two innings, whatever, and a guy goes out and throws two innings and 12 pitches, you're not sending them back out there for a third inning. You know, you reward that guy, let him sit down, let him be done. And, um, you know, other, there's just so many things like that. It, you know, rain delays. For every 30 minutes, you subtract an inning. You know, stuff like that that, you know, no inside misses with a lead after the six. You know, there's just so many things that he's taught me that, that we're able to put into play, you know, whether it's throwing programs, mound progression, build up for a season, uh, whatever it may be that, that, you know, I have at my fingertips, but yeah, that notebook is, will never leave my side. So <laughs> until he tells me he wants it back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, what, Caleb, what is something, I, and I don't want to ask Leo a similar question, but Caleb, what is something, you know, you know so much about his career and about him. What's something that, people don't ask him about that they should be asking him about? Oh, man. You know, I think everybody wants to know about the big three, right? I mean, that's the first topic of comment. I mean, you just listen to, what was it, five different college coaches ask him questions. They could ask him anything in the world, and every single one of them revolved around, you know, Smoltz, Maddox, or, or Glavin. And at the end of the day, we're not pitchers anymore. You know, I think stuff that people should be asking Leo and that I ask Leo a lot is about him, you know, and, and where he came from. And I think the biggest thing, man, is is the humble, the willing to learn, you know, and, and that's what he's still doing. It. You know, there's times whenever I'm sitting there and I'm talking pitch and say, you know, man, I maybe I hadn't thought of it that way. And for first of all, I think, well, there's no way, but, you know, for, for, Leo, to have as much success as he's had, he is incredibly humble, first of all, and obviously generous with his time, but the amount that he cared for his guys is by far and away uh, the biggest thing to me, just going back to even, you know, the virtual clubhouse for game six of the World Series the other day. Leo just hanging out with his guys, man. And, you know, I think I even put out a tweet talking about this was the most important baseball talk of 2020. Because to me it was, man. And it's so hard for us as coaches right now. We're all trying to figure out a way to get an edge, a way to get a little bit better. And, you know, at the end of the day, man, it's still guys. It's still around ball. It's still around bat. Those guys during that time, man, they were talking about each other's wives, each other's kids. You know, David Justice's son signing with UCLA. Just, you know, they're talking about life. And at the end of the day, you know, Leo did that as good as anybody. You know, being able to get to know his players. And that's not easy to do, man. I mean, when, when you're a college coach and your livelihood a lot of times depends on the success of 18 to 21, 22-year-olds, sometimes that's tough to do. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not easy getting in the car after a tough loss and, and to not be bitter. But you got to show back up to that part. You know, willing to, to go back to battle like, like Leo did with, with Avery and, and being able to talk to those guys and get on their same level and say, listen, I get it. You know, I'm hurting with you, but we're going to go back to war with you. And to me, that's the most important stuff that anybody, especially young pitching coaches like myself, can take away from, from a Hall of Fame coach, in my opinion. 
Leo, what's the motivation? He talks about, you know, your, your willingness to learn and you want to continue learning. Why? What's the motivation to continue learning for you at this point? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you, you listen to, uh, I've heard of Coach Harker and Caleb say a few things and, and put it in a way that I went, guys thought back and said, you know, I wish I'd have put that in that, that type of uh, uh, way that they, they said something, you know, or I learned a couple things that they used on some uh, certain plays or whatever, and I went, well, that sounds good. I like that. I wish I'd have had that, you know, stuff like that. But, I mean, it's you're always, uh, you know, you let your mind work for you a little bit, you know. it's uh, And you're always – I'm not going to just say, okay, well, I know everything now. You know, I, I've never ever felt that way. I'm sure there's things that I don't know, but I am I, – what I do feel very strongly about is the reputation that we had for healthy arms. And that's the most – that's what I – my career – uh, uh, if there's one thing I want everybody to remember about my career was how health, healthy our pitching staff stayed over that great 14 straight run. And uh, the, uh, the, the the starting pitchers average in making 146 of your 162 game scheduled starts over 14 years. I mean, yeah, and, and maybe like going 500 and some starts without missing one, you know, uh, it's, uh, those are the things that I'm most proud of. And, and uh, you know, I locked in so much on the pitching that that uh, uh, a lot of things, like I said, I let other coaches in their areas take care of their business. And what I learned in the game was this. There's a lot of, when I first got to the minor leagues, when I first got to the minor leagues, and I'm sure it still goes on a little bit today, I thought everybody worked together to put together a product to get them to the big leagues. And what I found out was coaches jockeying for position to get the credit for this person going to the big leagues. And I watched how this was going on around me, and I said, I don't ever want to be like that. Because you know what? I saw players lose respect for coaches that did that sort of thing. They ain't stupid. They know what's going on. And I, you know, and I used to, I said, I kept saying, stay in your, I stay in your own area. If you're running a business or doing whatever you want, stay in your own area. Take care of what you're supposed to take care of. Your other people are going to take care of that. You know, don't come up to me and say, how come, you know, another coach come up and say, well, are we pitching inside enough? I don't want to hear that. I didn't go up. I didn't go over to their coach and say, or, oh, well, let's see, uh, uh, were we playing that guy the right way?" I don't, never said that. I locked in on the pitchers, and that's what I did. And I stayed with them. And I and, and that was that was the way it was. I mean, I think that's a great life lesson. I think too many people in charge of things want to take all, get all the credit, and deflect all the blame. No question. And and to do the reverse is an art. And it's also, I mean, it's empathy. It's, and it, I hope, think it helps bring out the best in your players um, because they know you care, right? That's a, no question about it, you know. Well, you know, one of the toughest jobs, we had to get Mike Hampton to enjoy the game again. I mean, you know, he, he, he and here's, you know, and here's what Mike Hampton felt bad because he didn't live, he didn't live up to his contract in Colorado. I told him, I said, well, who's going to, you know? I mean, you're never going to pitch good there. I don't care who he is. And, you know, you might get in there for a quick, quick, quick four game series and get out. But for to play this, your own ballpark, I don't care who you are. We, ain't, you know, you're not pitching good there over a period of time. And so anyway, so my, Hammy was pretty, pretty down when we got him in a trade. And um, I said, to, you know, I, I thought to myself, I asked Maddox, I said, How come, what can we do to make him start enjoying himself more? I said, he's embarrassed about his contract, you know, that he had in Colorado. And I said, how do you approach that? And the Maddox says, when I when I had my contract talks to Leo, he said, I tell I say, I've been I'm being paid for what I've done, not what I'm about to do. So I went to Hampton. I said, hey, 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 hey come here, I got something for you. <laughs> and I said, You don't need to feel bad about that anymore. He goes, Why? I said, because let me tell you what Maddox said, you know. And I told him that, and all of a sudden there was a you could see him starting to, you know, I said, So come on, I start enjoying the game again. I said, You were great with Houston and the Mets. And you'll be great again here. I said, so let's get over this crap, you know. <laughs> that's awesome. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great lesson. So looking at historical pitchers and looking at pitchers today, if you had to pick one pitcher back in the day, a competitor or, or on another team that you maybe didn't play, who would you pick? Who would you have really wanted to coach? And then looking to today, what pitcher stands out to you as somebody that's kind of uh, got it to you? Right. Um, man, I don't know about the who we faced. Uh, uh, you know, I always, I always thought that Kevin Brown was a very intimidating pitcher. Uh, 
but then I got, you know, and then he, and he was, uh, 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 he was nasty. He was nasty on the mound. Kevin Brown would be a guy that, I don't know why it came to mind. It just did, but I'm sure there's a lot of guys I would love to have had the privilege of coaching, you know, and, and in today's game, uh, you know, I love what, uh, uh, Washington did with Serger and, uh, and Strasburg and, uh, how they used them. And, uh, so, you know, I love Bumgarner, you know, classic left-hander. And I'm sure I'm forgetting people. I love Soroka, the young rookie right-hander for, for the Braves. Um, love to be able to work with him and, and uh, Freed, the, the left-hander that they have. Um, but, I, you know, there's a lot of pitchers that uh, I got the privilege of coaching in, 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 uh, in five All-Star games and uh, got to know some guys that you would love to have had on your club, you know. And then you got to know a couple. You might not say, "Well, man, maybe." maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never, uh, I never ran into a pitcher that I didn't like, unless he proved me wrong. What did you, um, what did you take away? How did you enjoy or not enjoy? Or what did you take away from your experience uh, in Baltimore? It's miserable. Yeah. <laughs> so why well, like, went, went, because you know you it, it was a completely different setup i mean i had a great great time and a lot of people don't remember eric bedard and jeremy guthrie two great kids and bedard had was a was a 15 14 15 game winner for two years and jeremy guthrie went on to have a great career uh uh jerry jeremy guthrie i got a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction uh, cleveland didn't want him and we ended up with him in spring training in baltimore and i said and he was throwing good. And I said, Jeremy, how come, how come Cleveland doesn't want you, you know? And he said, well, Leo, he said, did they tell me I'm too smart, that I think too much? And I'm too smart for myself. And I said, you know what, Jeremy? I said, a wise man told me one time, if you can't think, you can't pitch. And I said, I think a, brain, a smart brain is a wonderful thing. I said, so you're not too smart as far as I'm concerned. Just do, be yourself. And with Bedard, you know, he was stubborn. And uh, he taught me a thing. He, used to, he had a fastball that he cut. A uh, fastball that he cut on the outside corner to a right-handed hitter, and I said, "You know, Eric," I said, uh, and he, I said, "That's a dangerous pitch." He said, "They can't hit that pitch, Leo." I said, "But if it comes back to the barefoot zone, you know," I said, "I'd rather see that pitch go off the end, uh, uh, the other way." He goes, "I'm telling you, they can't hit that pitch." I said, "Okay, show me." Well, guess what? They couldn't hit it. You know, so, so if, if knock yourself out, but it was it was ownership. You know, the chain of command, the Braves had a great chain of command. It was never broken. Ted Turner, Stan Kasten, John Sherholz, Bobby Cox, everything, and us working with the minor leagues. In Baltimore, it was, you never knew what the owner was going to do. And, uh, you know, players could come, go and voice their complaints. Well, when that happens, you have no chance. So was it a matter of, you know, at least in title, upward movement and getting a chance to be a head coach? And what did you learn there that you would give to a, a kid like Caleb saying, hey, as you're going through the process, trying to move up, be on the lookout for this, this, or this? You mean when I was in Baltimore? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you went to you went to Baltimore, and obviously you didn't think it was going to be terrible. That's why you went. No, there. I didn't. I kind of knew the, as soon as I got there. But I, I, once I saw how everything operated, that I went, uh oh, got my work cut out so, for me. So, what would you suggest to you know, like Caleb, is he goes through his career and tries to move up? Like, what are some things that he should look at that maybe you missed at the time? Well, I, I, I think I, I I went in thinking that I was going to change the culture. And so in, ch in trying to change that culture, I, I kind of uh, uh, got very aggressive. I'll put it that way. Got very aggressive. And uh, I think if I thought it, if I was going to do that now, I think I would have in, in, went in without, without a bang, without a big bang. I would have kind of lowballed everything. And I went the other way. I thought, well, they, they're bringing me in. And then I went too hard, trying too hard to change the culture of the, of the organization. I had no chance, you know. But I think if I had to do it all over again, I would have lowballed that thing a lot more than what I did. And if Caleb goes to, when he goes to another major college, when his run at Furman is done, you, you know, you try not to go in as, I, I would get, tell him, don't go in as the big shooter. You know, go in as, uh, you know, I was named the top assistant coach of any coach in the history of sports by Sports Illustrated. But by the time I got to Baltimore, when they said, who's hot and who's not, <laughs> I was the not. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I, I would go in more low key and low ball everything as opposed to going in on a high note per se and of a background of success when there's a lot more to it than me just being a pitching coach. 
you know, you have to have a great organization behind you and you have to have the support of everybody. And uh, I had that in Atlanta, no question about it. I had to, I was blessed to be in Atlanta. And I was, it was a privilege to be there for 15 years. So when you have a chance to really go big time, I mean, that was big time. So, but when you're trying to, you know, jump into a new place, I go in and lowball it. On the next episode of Learning from Leo. This is taking it to a whole new level. You don't break the rules. We pitched in that era. That mean, I, I thought that's how great our pitching was. He said if his, if his batting average is down, he's going to shoot you to left center. If his power numbers are down, he's going to turn and burn. And he's been punished enough. I think they should let him in. Well, you won 300 and some games. Yeah, give me a break. That's the only hitter that we ever did that with. In the clutch, Will Clark was as great a hitter as I've ever seen. You can't execute the simplicity if you can't get on the mound and throw. Why not take advantage of the tools that you have available to you? I said, in the minor leagues, don't you teach everybody to use the whole field? They're talking about the game of baseball. I mean, come on. Once the game starts, mechanics stop. Here's where mechanics go haywire. If you start to overthrow, you shouldn't have to look on your wristband and say, where do I play this guy? That's a joke. Now, before the pitch counts went up on the wall, you know, I should cheat on my clicker a little bit, you know. They're going to do it right. Get the pitchers out of the way so we can get some work done around here. No eye wash. You know what eye wash is? No, I mean, everybody want to know why I rocked all the time, but, you know, that's just something I did when I was a kid in the high chair, uh, beating my back of my head up against the wall, in a, in a high, and that's, that explains a lot. <laughs>